learn Chinese arts and culture at Western Sydney University. Right now for us is afternoon. Um, so I, I'm Professor Jing Han, the director of this, in, this institute. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that the today's seminar is held on the country of the Darug people of the Darug nation, whose ancestors have been the traditional owners of their lands for thousands of years and pay our respect to the, to the First Nations elders, past, present, and emerging. Welcome to Music in Society webinar series and to today's webinar, uh, webinar two, entitled Self-Alienation in Sinophone Music by Dr. Gavin Lee, a very interesting topic that I, I found. And we are very honored and privileged to have a special guest to open the session. Dr. Mercedes Duhonko is an eminent researcher of Chinese music at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. She received her PhD in, in ethnomusicology from the University of Washington and a Bachelor of Music in Piano from the College of Music of the University of the Philippines. She was a postdoc fellow at the University of Alberta, assistant professor of music at New York University and associate professor of music at the Bard College in New York. She also has held visiting faculty positions at the Shanghai Conservatory of Music and at the Suzhou University of Science and Technology. Mercedes' uh, main area of research is on the music tradition of a Chaozhou Chinese subculture in Eastern Guangdong and of the Chaozhou diaspora in Southeast Asia. She has also written about Su, uh, Suzhou string and wind ensemble tradition of other regional subcultures in South China, as well as on the musical labor of Filipino musicians overseas. Uh, Dr. Duhonko is currently on a research project at the City University of Hong Kong to explore the cantonization adaptation of Western instruments in the Cantonese opera ensemble. Now let's welcome Dr. Duhonko to open the seminar. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, it's uh, morning here in Hong Kong. Uh, it is my honor and I'm very delighted to join this panel. Thank you for the invitation of the Institute and uh, Western Sydney University. Um, I have been invited to chair the, the question and answer afterwards, but also I think uh, I can, I'll take this opportunity to say a few remarks to preface the talk by Dr. Gavin Lee on the subject of self-alienation in Sinophone music. Uh, although I will be mainly speaking about um, from the perspective of an ethnomusicologist who's worked in China and uh, maybe alienation in China mainly. Uh, so when, when, when we talk about alienation, uh, it has to do with the negation of cultural traditions and identity that is attendant uh, as a result of colonization most of the time, or uh, cultural contact and rapid modernization slash westernization. And in the case of China, it is more complicated. Uh, I think Dr. Lee is speaking mainly on the contemporary period, basically in, in this uh, post-Mao uh, economic reform era. Uh, I think even, especially now during the Xi Jinping period. Um, but I'd like to just uh, preface the talk by uh, contextualizing uh, historically the, the notion of, or the, the phenomenon of alienation, cultural alienation, self-alienation in Chinese culture. Uh, um, Dr. Lee is speaking about this in terms of the negation and privileging of Western music over Chinese traditional ones in China and in the Sinophone or Chinese speaking world, uh, that is Singapore. Um, we, when it comes to China, first of all, I don't think we can talk about colonization because it has never really been fully colonized. Although Shanghai has been divided like a pie by, uh, by at least five Western imperial powers. And uh, it was only uh, during the, uh, the, the 1911 or actually a little bit uh, earlier that it, it started to wrest itself from 
in this kind of, uh, or, or the 20, uh, in the 1920s, that it tries to wrest itself uh, from, its, uh, from its imperial past and uh, facing these colonial challenges, uh, tried to adapt uh, Western culture and Western music and the movement that was behind this was the May 4th movement after uh, China was defeated by Japan um, um, in, the, in that period and uh, annexation of Manchuria and eventually the occupation of uh, China uh, during the 30s uh, occurred. So uh, there was a sense that Western culture was superior and that the defeat was due to the old traditions and uh, um, basically the out of touch and very confusion uh, based culture that was uh, attended in China before the opening to the West. Uh, so that was one thing. There was this conscious adaptation of Western culture and turning away from a Chinese tradition one, a tonoclasm. So that is one. And then I would like to point out uh, the, I would say it was a socialist uh, alienation that uh, became very prominent uh, during the opening of the economic reform period in the early 80s. And uh, the Communist Party's previous repeated campaigns against remnants of China's feudal past and a repudiation of its Maoist persona after Mao's death resulted in a vacuum, in a cultural vacuum and confusion uh, in China. Uh, where do we turn now? You know, there's a questioning of uh, not only the Chinese self, the Chinese traditions, but the socialist uh, persona that was in China uh, prior to uh, the economic reforms and during the, the 60s and the Cultural Revolution. So there was this confusion. And I think um, during that period, Western music was also banned. And there was a turning in and trying to find a, a socialist, modernized uh, music. And that's why we had the, um, the, the revolutionary operas uh, during the, the Maoist uh, era, especially during the Cultural Revolution. Um, certain uh, abstract music, expressionist music was also banned. So there was, you know, there was really nowhere to turn to. On the one hand, uh, return to Western, uh, to Chinese traditions was kind of uh, suspect. And at the same time, um, going with what they have known up to that point about Western music um, was also kind of suspect as well, very much suspect, I would say. So uh, it is in this context that we are now confronted with uh, Chinese music and Chinese and Western music in this era. Um, of course, the 80s was an opening, uh, reopening of China to the West and um, there was a flood of um, um, media, music, art, culture from the West. And this is now what we see in China. You know? and, and there was this uh, drive to modernize and really bring China into the political and world stage as, uh, as, as a country that's on par with uh, the superpowers. So uh, it is in this context, I think, that we should remember uh, when Dr. Li speaks about self-organization in China. Uh, I'm not gonna, uh, of course, this is in China and it's also gonna talk about um, the, the situation in Singapore. And uh, with that, I will, um, I will end my uh, this preface and I would like to introduce Dr. Gavin Lee. So Dr. Li is assistant professor at Suzhou University in China. Uh, he uses a combination of ethnographic and musicological methods in the investigation of uh, myriad sinophon musical genres from traditional to avant-garde. Uh, his research appears in the Journal of the Royal Music Association, Current Musicology, Music Theory, Spectrum, and Music Analysis. He is the author of the forthcoming monograph, Estrangement from Ethnicity, Music, and Sinophone Alienation, and editor of two books, Thinking Difference in Gender, Sexuality, and Popular Music, um, Theory and Politics of Ambiguity, 
and the forthcoming queer ear in making um, music theory. Um, he has convened several panels on this topic of decolonization and also combination in um, several symposia and conferences. And um, since 2020, Dr. Lee has presented eight guest lectures in three continents at universities in the US, Australia, Taiwan, and China. Uh, with this, I would like to uh, open, uh, I would like to bring you Dr. Gavin Lee. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mercedes, for that uh, introduction. Uh, I want to begin by thanking Jing Han, uh, Professor Jing Han, and uh, Nicholas for uh, this invitation. Uh, I, I actually know all three of you uh, very well, and you're all really, uh, really wonderful people. Um, also, thank you to uh, Mercedes for uh, that historical contextualization over, uh, I would say, the past 200 years, where we have a range of European forces cultural and military uh, impacting China and the Sinophone world. Uh, I'd just like to quickly preface that uh, my paper today uh, follows on the trend of uh, directly addressing racism in music studies. Uh, this follows on uh, Danielle Brown's open letter criticizing ethnomusicology. It follows on the, IC, uh, the International Council for Traditional Music's uh, dialogues on decolonization. And another, uh, another way, uh, another aspect of uh, me prefacing this is to mention that I belong to a uh, younger generation of music scholars who feel equally comfortable in musicology as in ethnomusicology, and you will find that we often appear uh, in both kinds of conferences. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today uh, is the uh, effects of uh, racism on Chinese identity. So it really is about racial alienation. And with that, uh, let me begin. Part one, the concept of self-alienation. This paper is about self-alienation of Chinese people from Chinese identity as well as Chinese music. Self-alienation occurs because of the saturation of the global media space with Chinese stereotypes. The pervasiveness of such stereotypes can be seen in recent years with the high-profile retraction of multiple advertisements uh, which consumers in China found to be offensive. Companies which featured small-eyed Chinese models, models with broken English and chopsticks in the hair include Gucci, Dior, Dolce & Gabbana and Mercedes-Benz. The result of pervasive racism is seen with an informant Victoria Chen in Singapore, whose views are indicative. Chinese music reminds her of Chinese stereotypes, quote, especially the foreigners, they just think that we are all Kung Fu Panda, eating noodles, that kind of thing. I feel that it is very cliched and I don't want to be related to that, the Kung Fu and Chinese New Year, unquote. Chen teaches piano and dislikes Chinese music that she regards as sharp in timbre and very high. By way of explanation about sharp Chinese timbre, Chen incorrectly added that there are no low register Chinese instruments like the Western trombone or tuba. We can see that racial stereotypes do not just prompt protests as with angry consumers in China. Chinese stereotypes also lead to the negation of Chinese music and identity. Nevertheless, this negation is an agential act undertaken by people surrounded by racist stereotypes such that, for them, authentic Chinese musicality and identity is not even an option. For some people in this scenario, the only mode of being that makes sense, that feels true somehow, is self-alienation. To discern agency in authentic self-alienation, we have to stop investing oppressive or emancipatory powers in particular musics as if sounds in themselves have intrinsic properties. Rather, it is the intentions of music makers which is more important. Being the negation or absence of Chinese identity and Chinese musical preference, self-alienation is a concept that runs counter to the emphasis on, uh, on identity in music studies. In response to my work, one prominent scholar argued that self-alienation simply doesn't exist. Another tried to argue that alienation exists, but in the form of identities. For example, heavy metal music fans construct a marginal identity rooted in disaffection from the mainstream. <laughs> 
But what I'm arguing in this paper is not that self-alienation is universal, simply that it exists. It goes without saying that identity has been central to music studies in terms of race, class, gender, sexuality, and ability. However, the understanding of identity in music studies is not complicated enough, not nuanced enough, and it does not take the full literature on identity into account. There has in fact always been a lively debate about the subject. Criticisms of identity have centred on the fact that marginalised identities emerge in an unjust system such that the very mention of identities reproduces their injustice. Rather than identity, studies of affect and embodiment provide a fuller and richer description of marginal experiences. Rather than individual identities or even intersectional identities, we also need to think about coalition building as articulated from the earliest days of queer theory by writers such as Kathy Cohen. Perhaps most importantly, studies are focused on redistribution and change could articulate different futures rather than replicate the oppressive present. By no means am I suggesting that identity is passé. I'm merely pointing out that identity is not an anti-racist panacea. Identity comes with its own problems, just as every methodology presents both opportunities and trappings. Simply put, identity does not have to preclude its opposite, self-alienation. In articulating what self-alienation is, a consistent reference point is Chinese people's Western musical preference, or as I call it, Western, uh, Chinese Western musical entanglement, which is frequently misunderstood. Historically, decolonization in East and Southeast Asia commenced not with the promotion of Asian culture, but with full-scale westernization from military weapons to music. I call this assimilationist decolonization, a paradoxical concept, if there ever was one. The founding father of China, modern China, Sun Yat-sen, for instance, was a Christian who studied the English language and British history in Hawaii and obtained US citizenship. It was these Western educated leaders who led revolutions that countered or toppled colonial rule. With this historical context in mind, I propose that Chinese Western entanglement paves the way towards a decolonial epistemology. It does so in two ways. First, Chinese Western entanglement overturns the epistemic recolonization of Sinophone geographies. This epistemic recolonization occurs when music scholars impose their interpretation of Chinese symphonies and avant-gardism as completely colonized, occluding the actual history of decolonization that began with westernization. Second, Chinese Western entanglement encounters the stereotypical view of the pure ethnic other who is regarded as an ethical paradigm. In, music, in US music studies, Resistance is almost always embodied in traditional musics, reinforcing the figure of pure ethnic otherness and ignoring the fact that students of Western art music outnumber that of Chinese music in the Sinophone world. In this paper, I show that resistance is found in Chinese Western musical entanglement. While self-alienation carries a negative connotation, I show that it may be the best that musicers can do in a racist world. Self-alienation can even be anti-racist and lead eventually to decolonization. The problem with the figure of the resistive ethnic other it is, it, it is that it is an oversimplification. This view, this reductive view, occludes the forces of racism, classism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and ableism within global milieus and traditional musics, and also occludes the counter-hegemonic intentions of BIPOC people who engage with Western sounds. This paper presents an alternative methodology that engages more fully with real-world complexity. I examine two Sinophone sites, Singapore and the city of Suzhou in China. Self-alienation as the absence of Chinese identity is seldom absolute. For instance, musicers may refer to Chinese food nor is self-alienation always the final stop. Self-alienation often propels different identifications and attitudes. In Singapore, musicers occupy a stable, self-alienated position, embracing a neo-colonial identity based on English language fluency and Western musical preference. 
In the Chinese city of Suzhou, however, musicists aim to close the perceived gap with Chinese identity through synthesizing discourses. In other instances, musicists may disguise and deflect from their self-alienation by changing the topic to multicultural musics and cosmopolitan identity. Finally, some musicists with Western musical preference find themselves de-Westernizing altogether, revealing an emergent decolonial attitude. In some, rather than absolute detachment from Chinese identity, self-alienation is better conceived as partial, comprising the selective repulsion from particular components in the Chinese assemblage, especially Chinese identity and music for the purposes of this paper. Self-alienation leads to a new or renewed identity to deflections and, in exceptional cases, to decolonization. In this paper, I use Sinophone to indicate the totality of the soundscape, which includes both Chinese and Western music, as well as minority musics. I use Chinese music to refer to traditional Chinese music. I use the term musicus to refer to both music makers and listeners. By Western music, I mean not just Western art music, but also Christian hymns, Western military band music, US school songs used in music education, jazz, rock, and popular music, all of which pervaded the Sinophone soundscape beginning in the 19th century. Chinese symphonies and avant-gardism fall under Western music in this paper for purposes of convenience. Part two, anti-racist self-alienation. My first case study is about how a Chinese Singaporean composer feels repelled by Chinese stereotypes and thus has an ambivalent relationship with Chinese culture. Born in 1968 in Singapore, Joyce Cole pursued postdoctoral studies in Paris, where she studied with Tristan Murai at IRCOM, uh, the Electronic Music Institute, and worked for a decade before moving back to Singapore in 2006. Aside from Murai, Cole's composition mentors include famous European composers such as Henri de Tio, Franco Donatoni, and Brian Finnehuff. She also identifies uh, some of the most influential composers such as Kaiser Sariaho and Michael Jarrell as stylistic references for her own music. Uh, and now let me do a quick share screen. Coast orchestral work Thai is based on the titular Chinese logogram seen in figure one. Composed in 1998 for the Singapore Symphony Orchestra, Thai was revised in 2002 for the BBC Symphony Orchestra and subsequently performed by the Hungari Hungarian Radio Orchestra. In brief, the work traces out the calligraphic strokes involved in rendering the logogram. Figure 2 on the screen shows the various calligraphic strokes of the logogram indicated with arrows. For example, if you can follow my pointer on the screen, these are strokes 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. In her musical version of the logogram, Ko diffuses the movement of each calligraphic stroke with her granulated post-spatulist musical language. What we hear is a highly dissonant, asynchronized group of sounds moving in a general direction, rather than the unified movement of a single calligraphic stroke. I will attempt to use my pointer to follow strokes 6 to 8 as we hear the music, uh, and as a, as a, as a, a pre-warning, uh, this music is highly dissonant. It is in the high modernist European style. stop share. Over the years, I've had a number of opportunities to speak with Ko, and her identification has fluctuated. In 2007, she said that she identifies with the European modernist canon, while also asserting that Thai could perhaps 
have only been written by an Asian composer. Six years later, however, Ko disassociated from Asian identity and said that her earlier comment relates more to European audiences' expectations that she should sound Chinese. In other words, Ko was self-alienated from her own Chinese identity because of Europeans who expected her to tick the ethnic box. This is reflected in the diffusion of the unified calligraphic strokes in Thai because of Ko's post-spatialist musical language. In addition, there is a complete absence of Chinese musical sounds, only the presence of the Chinese logogram. Furthermore, Ko tells me that she is interested in the logogram from a purely formalist perspective. She found the logogram to be visually spectacular and had no intention of expressing the meaning of the word. I found the case of Ko to be central to my explanation of what alienation comprises. Most music researchers would have encountered the term alienation in relation to Adorno, and so that uh, serves as a useful starting point. Uh, for the Frankfurt uh, uh, School of uh, critical, theory, uh, critical Theory, and for Adorno in particular, alienation is the result when the instrumental or goal-directed profit-making logic of capitalism runs amok, resulting in interchangeable musical commodities that are supposedly resisted by Schoenberg's atonal music, though not his Trautel music. Adorno thought that Trautel music expresses instrumental logic in the complete predetermination of pitches, where you would have a series of twelve, tone, 12 uh, pitches determined in advance, and the rest of the world would be sort of generated, almost uh, in a way auto-generated based on those 12 pitches. For Adorno, the alienation of the subject is expressed in the, quote, tension, contradiction, and pain, unquote, of atonal music, arousing the listener's, quote, unquote, resistance. It is perhaps unsurprising that there is a link here to Ko, who also uses advanced compositional techniques. Ko similarly articulates her compositional goal as just pain, as opposed to hackneyed musical emotions that we are familiar now with the saturation of, uh, of emotions in popular music and, and light classical music. Uh, in the in a, mark, in a music scene where music is essentially a commodity that's bought and sold. So in other words, for both Adorno and Co, pain has a resistive property. The difference between them is that Adorno is focused on resisting instrumental logic and musical commodification, whereas Co is resisting racist stereotypes. So she's resisting the construct of a Chinese culture. For her, for Ko, pain is preferable to the stereotype of Chinese music and culture. Such a stereotype range from the pentatonic cliché in uh, Kung Fu fighting to the characters of Ping Pong and Pang in the opera Turandot by Puccini. In 2007, when it alluded to cultural identity, Ko brought up the stereotype of slitty eyes, highlighting the saturation of the global milieu with racist stereotypes, a fact which is confirmed in the multiple instances when Western luxury brands had to retract their advertisements with small-eyed Chinese models. Ko also dismissed compositions that mimicked Chinese calligraphy in a more direct manner, drawing a squiggly line in the air with her hand as a caricature of those words. Here I think of tattoos of Chinese logograms on bodies and calligraphy scrolls owned by people with, who have no idea what the words mean. We can compare Ko's stance with that of the piano teacher Victoria Chen mentioned right at the beginning, who also noted the stereotyping of Chinese culture. Ko's self-alienation is seen in her identification with what she calls the European canon. Yet, this is not merely colonial capitulation, a concept which erases Ko's struggles in countering European audiences' orientalist expectations. Her intention is anti-racist and should be recognized as such, standing in intricate counterpoint with the fact that her anti-racism is achieved with a repurposing of European sounds. There is this constant tension between anti-racist intention and the central pitfall force of resounding European music.
Racial self-alienation in this paper has a genealogy that ultimately traces back to critical race theory rather than Frankfurt School critical theory. In the recently emerged discourse of Afrofuturism, racial alienation faced by Blacks have been interpreted in a couple of ways. First, enslaved Blacks were alienated from their humanity and treated as robotic machines of labour instead. Second, Blacks who first encountered white colonizers were alienated by the white people's, to them, strange appearance. These forms of alienation converge in the fantastical Afrofuturistic fabrications of author Kodwa Ishun, whose intergalactic confabulations involve spaceships and avant-garde jazz works, such as George Russell's Electronic Sonata for Souls Loved by Nature. The post-human figure in all this is the black appropriated robot, rather than the abject enslaved robot, deprived of their humanity. We now have an empowered futuristic machine which rejects the humanity that was denied to it by colonizers. Reaching back in critical race theory, racial, racial self-alienation has been present for more than a century. W.E.B. Du Bois' double consciousness refers to the conflict between self-awareness and the racist, stereotypical ways in which others see you. Franz Fanon theorized the split between self and body men and the way in, in which others see you through your skin color. In both cases, the gaze of the other results in self-alienation. What I have shown is that self-alienation can sometimes be appropriated for uh, anti-racism as we saw with Joyce Coe and the Afrofuturistic robot. This speaks to the unlimited creative agency of musicals. The concept of self-alienation represents a significant negation of mainstream discourses in music studies about identity, hybridity, and transculturation. Rather than identity, self-alienation in its purest form is the absence, the negation of identity. This means that self-alienation is the opposite of constructed identity, negotiated identity, and hybrid identity. For people living in a racist world, sometimes the, the way that they survive is in self-alienation, retreating for musicers to Western music instead. Other times, this apparent retreat may be a case of anti-racist self-alienation, dismantling Chinese stereotypes through avant-garde techniques. In contrast with hybridity and transculturation, self-alienation does not always lead to the production of new or renewed identifications, although it often does exactly that, as we will see in the next two parts of this paper. So that brings me uh, to uh, the next two parts, which is part three, embracing self-alienation, and part four, countering self-alienation. So part three, embracing self-alienation, neo-colonial identity. In Singapore, one response to self-alienation is the creation of a neo-colonial identity correlated with Western musical preference. This creole, indigenized, hybridized, and transculturated identity is what Marcus Lin called banana, using the term to refer to himself. Colloquially, Banana refers to Singaporeans who are Chinese by ethnicity but are acculturated to the English language and to Western art music and Western popular music. The cringeworthy idea is that a banana has a yellow skin but is white inside. But we have to remember that this identity is a colonial legacy created in response to the global saturation of Chinese stereotypes. Ultimately, the historical responsibility for bananas lie with colonizers, especially the British who colonized Singapore from 1819 to 1959. People in the world are doing the best that they can within colonial structures. The banana in Singapore is shaped in part by the language policy of the country. After experimenting with mixed language education in the 60s to 80s, where some schools offered English language curricula, while others offered Chinese language curricula, the government made the, deci the, the, uh, the decision in 1987 to have only English language schools where all subjects are taught in the English language. 
The effect of this cannot be underestimated. The most recent population census revealed that between 2010 and 20, 2020, in the space of 10 years, the percentage of Singapore residents who spoke primarily English climbed from 32 to 48%, so by almost 50%. The impact of English language education has a much uh, bigger impact than usage alone, with language ideology playing a structuring role in the social division of people into the so-called English-educated versus Chinese-educated. Bearing in mind that all students now go through English language education in Singapore, the two terms refer to how high schools in Singapore are divided into two groups. On the one hand, there is a small group of elite English schools, many of which have Christian missionary ties, where students tend to come from families with high English proficiency. Two boys' schools among the English schools are of note. It is said that Singapore is run by alumni of Raffles Institution, who populate the highest echelon of the government. Conversely, Singapore is owned by alumni of Anglo-Chinese school, who populate the highest echelon of the business world. Aside from a small handful of these English high schools, the rest of the high schools are categorized as Chinese high schools, where students tend to come from families with low English proficiency, with Chinese being the language spoken at home. From this background, it should be clear that banana as an identity is premised not just on English language and Western musical preference, but on class division, with a small bunch of bananas ruling Singapore. And if it's relevant, I attended a Chinese uh, secondary school and then I attended an English uh, junior high school. So I saw a little bit of both. From 2016 to 2018, uh, I led a research project which comprised interviews with Singaporeans of diverse ages and from all walks of life. I drew on those interviews, uh, I draw on those interviews in this section. Permission has been obtained from all informants cited in this paper to reproduce their statements. As mentioned earlier, Marcus Lin identifies, in his own words, as a banana. He enjoys music from Coldplay, Keen, Ed Sheeran, Josh Groban, Cats, Phantom of the Opera, Les Miserables, and Mamma Mia. Jonathan Lee, who does not, quote, quote unquote, very strongly identify with his Chinese ethnicity, enjoys music from The Cranberries, U2, Coldplay, Metallica, Lady Gaga, The Spice Girls, and Les Miserables. John Tan, who quote-unquote wouldn't say he's Chinese, thinks, China, uh, thinks Singaporeans are quote-unquote lucky to have been colonized because this meant that Singaporeans had access to Western, Western music records as early as the 1960s. He believes that Western art music must quote-unquote 2,000% be supported Tan's views accords with that published in a recent volume edited by Tommy Koh, Singapore's Ambassador at Large, and Scott Whitman, British High Commissioner to Singapore, that's titled 200 Years of Singapore and the United Kingdom. In the book, British colonial rule was described as, quote, 60% good and 40% bad, unquote. The statements above are the most obtuse articulation of neo-colonial identification. Because music researchers are frequently accustomed to thinking of ethnic others as paradigms of ethical resistance, the existence of neo-colonials may be jarring. This has led in the past to the dismissal of my work because neo-colonial identity is supposedly entirely predictable and hence unworthy of study. People have assumed in conversation that my research findings were are merely guesswork because the resistive other could not possibly be neo-colonial. I've even been uh, questioned on my own subject position as if I were a neocolonial promoting other neocolonials. Uh, neo the fact is that neocoloniality is an actually existing phenomenon that is more pervasive than decolonial or pro-Chinese musical attitudes. As a case in point, in both Singapore and China, there are more students of Western art music than traditional Chinese music. Erasing neocoloniality from research is like the proverb proverbial ostrich sticking its head in the sand, leaving the colonial legacy unexamined. As Kimberly Crenshaw argued, quote, when there is no name for a problem, you can't see a problem. When you can't see a problem, you can solve it, unquote. The only hope we have to counter neocoloniality is to begin by recognizing, naming, and examining the issue. It is not possible to ignore neocoloniality to death 
which is what some scholars are futilely trying to do. Neocolonial identity is deeply anchored in the ideology of modernity as embodied in Western art music. While those with no neocolonial Western musical preference may not identify explicitly as bananas, their musical preference emerged within colonial ideology. Informants believe that modern pop, or most of the music today, originate in Western art music. Notably, Marcus Lin believes that Western art music carries a lot of history and forms the basis of culture. Without Western art music, he claims, chances are, quote unquote, we'll all be listening to tribal music. Conversely, traditional music is seen as a relic of the past, out of sync with modern society, modern life, and modern identity. These are all quotes from informants. 59-year-old Lily Yeo said that Chinese music reminds her of, quote, old people, old society, and everything old. I will cause pain to myself in the evening with very old songs, unquote. Variations on the theme of Chinese music's outdated status include the following. One informant held the inaccurate notion that there has been no development in Chinese music, which supposedly explains why it is out of touch with modern society. Other informants stated that the very notion of preservation of Chinese music suggests that Chinese music is outdated or that Chinese music is already a lost art. Many informants said that they used to listen to Chinese music under parental influence, and several informants associate Chinese music with prior generations, with the 64-year-old piously stating that he believes that Chinese music will die out with his grandparents' generation. A sense of quote-unquote cultural loss was experienced by an informant who returned to China with its rich traditions uh, and felt that after returning to Singapore. Of the Singaporean, uh, Singaporeans interviewed, 60 Singaporeans interviewed, only one 61-year-old informant still actively attends Chinese music performances. <clears throat> Neocolonial attitudes towards putative Western musical modernity and supposedly outdated Chinese music tradition should prompt a paradigmatic shift in music studies. In recent decades, the concepts of modernity at large and alternative modernities have been influential. Such concepts paved the way for recognition of the pervasive global desire for modernity. However, the casting of global others as ethical paradigms has, has led to a gross misrecognition or an at least highly selective view of global modernity. It should be clear from my discussion of bananas that modernity functions as a colonial ideology that privilege, privileges Western art music and stereotypes Chinese music as antiquated. Seminal works of modernity critique includes Bruno Latour's We Have Never Been Modern and Eric Hobsbawm's The Invention of Tradition, uh, as well as uh, work in decolonial study, uh, uh, particularly uh, as meant, uh, in the work of uh, Walter McNallow, um, where he talks about modernity as the dark side of colon uh, colon uh, colonization. Unfortunately, music studies seem to have rarely heeded this literature. The modernity tradition dichotomy in Western versus Chinese music is reinforced with aesthetic and social valuation. Western art music is clearly ascribed a superior class status with informants describing it as cultured and associating with it with intelligence, elegance, and snobbish and educated sorts. This shows that the desire for Western modernity is driven not just, not just by the prestige of the West, but by the desire for class status, which is invested in Western art forms because of colonial history. The musical class difference is confirmed in Anthony Teo's loving description of his repeated listening of the Blue Danube, to which he closes his eyes and relaxes. Quote, you can really imagine the movement of the wave, unquote. This is contrasted with the quote-unquote ruffians who attend Getai or Chinese street uh, uh, Chinese music street concerts on makeshift stages. The abusive ruffians are found shouting and cursing and swearing, Tio said. Of Gertai music, he says, it is all nonsense. Most of them can't sing, and the music that accompanies them is awful, and the stage also looks very pathetic, unquote. John Tan, who thought that Western art music should be supported 2,000%, regards Chinese pop as a load of shit and really rubbish. Tan is of particular interest because he reveals the connection between neo-colonial bananas 
and cosmopolitanism. He is one of two listeners I encountered who deflected from their dislike of Chinese music by referring to other global or local musics. John Tan identifies as, quote, a citizen of the world, unquote, rather than Chinese, and says that he is, quote, open to all sorts of people like white, brown, green, unquote. We have encountered this cavalier dismissal and mocking of race using random colors before in US discourse, and Tan reminds us that racism is a global phenomenon. He goes on to refer to Chinese, Indian, Russian, Afghan, Iranian, and Indonesian musical excellence. But his professed musical cosmopolitanism seems to be dissembling from his self-alienation from Chinese music because earlier in the same interview, he had just expressed his opinion of what he called cultural music as second rate, performed by those who couldn't make it in Western music. John Tan's response to his self-alienation is to deflect from it in an unfortunate turn to a racist, colorblind, cosmopolitanist disguise. A parallel deflection is seen with Valerie Sim. When asked about Chinese music, she asserted a multicultural Singaporean identity, referring to Indian and Malay music instead. Part 4. Countering self-alienation. Chinese re-affiliation. In this section, I examine musicals in Suzhou, China, which is about half an hour away from Shanghai by high-speed rail. Unlike in Singapore, in Suzhou, the response to self-alienation is not neo-colonial identification, but Chinese ethnic re-affiliation. I define Chinese re-affiliation as the overcoming of a perceived temporary gap from Chinese identity. This gap results from both Western musical preference and Chinese musical dispreference. The case studies in this section are drawn from interviews with people in Suzhou, from educational ethnography from my own teaching at Suzhou University, and from Chinese language articles on Chinese composers of Western art music. In Suzhou, interviews were conducted with informants aged 20, uh, 20 to 30 and from all walks of life. Informants were asked about the local vocal genres of the opera, Chinese opera Kunqi and the Chinese song genre Ping Tan, and about Chinese music generally. It is clear that while there is some level of interest in the song genre Ping Tan, Informants primarily listen to other musical genres, especially, especially Chinese popular music. As in Singapore, listeners associate the song genre Ping Tan with their parents' generation. Ping Tan listeners and audiences are generally in their 40s and above. Furthermore, young adults in Suzhou do not understand the Suzhouese dialect or tupolect used in Ping Tan performances. The association, uh, the, the association of Ping Tan with the past is reinforced with one informant's reference to how Ping Tan used to be considered to be a glamorous genre uh, performed in a particular hotel of yesteryear when one would travel via rickshaw, considered a luxury at the time, to attend a performance. More generally, a music teacher noted that there is a declining number of students of Chinese music, especially for the lute tipa, the Chinese dosima yang qin, and the Chinese mouth organ sheng, as compared with the rising number of piano students. Against this picture of the recession of Chinese music into the past, some informants feel a perceived gap from their Chinese identity and make attempts at ethnic reaffiliation. The most striking example of this is that of Mei Ling, who plays in a rock band that tried, albeit unsuccessfully, to create hybrid music, hybrid music by collaborating with a Chinese lute pipa player. They also bought a two-string fiddle erhu, even though they did not know how to play the Chinese instrument. A broad range of other listeners clearly value traditional Chinese music, even though they prefer Chinese popular music. They may know a lot about Chinese music history or about Ping Tan performance, or they may, they may want their children uh, to learn uh, Chinese instruments, even though they may not attend Chinese music concerts. Another site where I observed Chinese reaffiliation was in my own classes in Chinese music history at Suzhou University, where I have taught Western music, uh, uh, Western music performance majors for seven years. Uh, and again, uh, 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 obtain, uh, permission to talk about this was obtained from students. The same colonial music ideology as found in Singapore 
was first introduced to China in the early 20th century by Chinese thinkers such as the first principal of Shanghai Conservatory, Xiao Youmei. According to Xiao, Chinese art music is superior to China, uh, sorry, Western art music is superior to Chinese music, according to Xiao Youmei. And so for him, Chinese music was regarded as being in need of modernization. Western art music is rational as seen in its functional harmony and musical form, whereas Chinese music lacks harmony and was supposedly irrational, languid, and decadent. To this day, popular discourse casts Western music as rational and Chinese music as affective. I did come across one student, Zhong Han, who articulated the uh, colonial ideology of Western musical superiority, but he was immediately greeted with a chorus of protests uh, from his classmates, and I'll just quickly mention that uh, I'm using pseudonyms for all the, all the students. That act of the, of the classmates protesting is an act of group Chinese reaffiliation, as seen uh, on the group level. And this is seen on the individual level, this Chinese reaffiliation with another student, Jia Hao. Although he majors in classical guitar, Western guitar, Jia Hao distanced himself from Western music by saying that the piano is a clumsy instrument. That is an act of Chinese reaffiliation that is reinforced by his rapid firing of normative, well rehearsed, patriotic pro Chinese discourse on several occasions. Students' Chinese reaffiliation was clearly demonstrated through a survey and class discussion. The choice of answer for each survey question was Chinese music, Western music, or both. The survey showed that the majority of students thought that Chinese music better represented their group and individual identity, and that Chinese music, rather than Western music, should be preserved and appreciated by more people. Conversely, they regarded Western music as good music over Chinese music. They also listened to Western music more frequently and derived more enjoyment out of it. A question which stumped almost half the class, who provided no answer for that question, was which music represents the future of China? In the class discussion which took place after the survey, students responded to that question only after a long pause. Eventually, I found out that their not answering the question and pausing during the class discussion was because they felt that the answer to, Chinese music, uh, to China's musical future lay neither with uh, traditional Chinese music nor with Western music. They eventually said that traditional Chinese music is marginalized, but composers such as Brightsheng integrate tradition in his music, thus reinventing culture. They mentioned Lang Lang's performance of Chinese folk song arrangements and are proud to see Chinese artists on the international stage of Western art music. They also mentioned the integration of folk songs in Chinese popular music. In sum, students use Brightsheng, Lang Lang and folk pop hybridity to synthesize Western music, effecting Chinese reaffiliation. The most striking instance of Chinese reaffiliation uh, re occurred at the end of a class on the widespread westernization that occurred in China after the May 4th movement of 1919. To conclude the class, I organized a class debate on a provocative motion based on Xiao Yumei's musical evaluation that Western music is superior to Chinese music. I use debates both to summarize the main points covered in a history lesson and to allow outstanding students the space to exercise their reasoning abilities. After hemming and hawing for a while, repeatedly stopping mid-sentence, a student, Jian Hong, who was supposed to argue for the pro side, that is, that to argue for Western musical superiority in the historical context, he eventually said that music cannot be compared in this manner. Sensing students' refusal to rehearse Xiao Yumei's historical arguments, I converted the debate into a discussion topic in which students may freely express their opinions. Jian Hong's hesitance embodied resistance to the discourse of Western musical superiority. His embodied resistance compelled me to alter the pedagogical framework, showing in no uncertain terms that musicers always have agency, regardless of whether they are playing Western or Chinese instruments. In relation to the above cases, Chinese reaffiliation, uh, in addition to the above cases, Chinese reaffiliation can also be observed in Chinese language articles about Chinese composers. 
A near universal pattern can be observed whereby the composers are first praised for their inventiveness as seen in the hybridizing and fusion of Chinese and Western avant-garde musical elements, but this is followed by discourse that reverts back to pure Chinese national identity. This duality of purification and hybridity has been analyzed elsewhere by Anna Maria Ochoa Gautier and others, and time limitations uh, prevent me from going into further detail. That brings me to part five, conclusion. In this paper, I have shown the existence of self-alienation caused by racist stereotypes, under which I include the notion of traditional Chinese music and, traditional, uh, and tradition in general as being out of touch. That is a racist stereotype. Self-alienation is the absence of identity. In some cases, self-alienation may be the most authentic mode of existence musicers could find given the colonial legacy of racism. Anti-racist self-alienation is seen in Joyce Coe's dismantling of Chinese calligraphic stereo uh, stereotype through avant-garde compositional techniques. A marked difference is observed between Singapore and Suzhou, where Singapore produced neocolonial bananas, while Suzhounese opt for Chinese reaffiliation. These are all really existing cultural phenomena that are occluded if we ignore Sinophone musicers with, who engage with Western music and who constitute the majority of music students in both Singapore and China. I would describe what we need as a shift from folk music to music folks, which may include the full range of musicers, including, as I've detailed elsewhere, Sinophone composers of Christian hymns, Sinophone symphonies, sinophone sopranos, sinophone musicologists, and more. As we've seen, colonial musical ideology is received differently in different sinophone sites and is thus worthy of study, as are the varied responses and creativity of really existing musicers. Racism cannot be ignored to death, no matter how hard we try. I see the inability to address racism and the colonial legacy of self-alienation as a form of what Robin D'Angelo has termed right fragility. In normal conversation, one form of right fragility is seen in changing the topic to anything other than race, because some white people cannot face the fact of racism. In music research, the parallel is when music scholars ignore musical coloniality and musical racism, deny the existence of racial self-alienation, and rather focus just on resiliency. We see resi uh, resiliency a lot uh, when there is an exclusive focus on the resistive ethnic other who is configured as decolonial and anti-racist almost by default, by virtue of their otherness. Most commonly, these others are thought to be, protect, uh, to be practitioners of uh, traditional music. But when we don't name the oppressive forces of coloniality and racism, we don't see how music makers are actively resisting the grossly distortionary stereotype of traditional Chinese music as an unchanging fossil. We don't see listeners countering the neocolonial ideology of bananas. The Decolonizing Ethnomusicology Facebook page is full of resilience narratives. But global others are not resistive by default. Yet they are regarded precisely as such a lot of the time, where any and all global musicking is seen as resistance against Western art music. This kind of resistance rests entirely on difference and the assumption that global musicers are always expressing their ethnic identity, a thesis which may reflect how global others are pigeonholed into an identity grid by some music scholars, rather than how global others see ourselves. I've argued precisely that global others may exist in self-alienation rather than identity. Pure identity expression in a racism-free contextual vacuum is highly problematic, with miracle music workers, uh, music makers apparently solving racism just by expressing themselves. This is the equivalent of posing pictures of survivors of natural disasters apparently smiling their way out of a horrible reality. In some segments of US musical academia, resilience is possibly self-serving, conscripting distorted figures of global others to do the work of curricular decolonization, where global others probably have little to no interest in the state of US music institutions. In other words, Global others 
decolonizing out there in the world is different from what faculty do. What faculty do, what faculty should do is to decolonize, decolonize our curricula and decolonize our research methods. And the music makers out there in the world cannot substitute for the work that we need to do. So to paraphrase decolonial theorists, Eve Tuck and Kevin Young, decolonization requires the identification of and dismantling and dismantling of specific colonial structures. And Western music is a big part of that, of these colonial structures. I'll leave the final word for Ken Tay, who attended school at a time when Chinese language education was still available in Singapore, and yet he listens to musicals such as Cats, Les Miserables, and Phantom of the Opera, and he used to work in, uh, in, with those musics when he used to uh, work as a professional in theatre. Uh, Kante, who was 50 years old at the time of the interview, explained that his younger self sought class status through musicals, but he now sees Western music as, quote, camouflage for you to brainwash yourself, telling yourself that you're current, unquote. Singaporeans pursuing Western art music are what he now calls a fake angmore, or a fake white person, uh, chasing after a quote, fake Prada, a fake bag, unquote. I highlight Tay because he is the rare example of actual decolonization in which there is both the naming and dismantling of coloniality. In this case, decolonization was ultimately powered not by positively existing identity, but by the absence thereof. Notably, there is a double movement of self-alienation, first from Chinese identity, the lack of which prompted a neo-colonial identity. The second move was self-alienation from that very neo-colonial identity, which prompted a new decolonial identity. Such is the complexity of Chinese identity, which is better conceived as an external object to which musicers may be attracted to or repelled from in myriad ways, reaching a level of complexity far exceeding discourses of positively existing identity, whether this is constructed Chinese identity or hybrid identity. And with that, uh, I thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, it was a very interesting talk, and uh, I think it is like, uh, it's packed with a lot of, uh, with a lot of um, concepts and uh, how to refute uh, certain um, cultural tendencies. And I think you could have given this paper on Singapore a lot. And uh, before I open the floor, uh, I think I'll, I'll take my privilege as the chair, uh, maybe to, to get the ball rolling and react to some of your statements here. Um, you know, as an ethnomusicologist, I, um, I'm into context. That's why I, I even opened the, uh, this session by uh, giving a short historical context alienation, uh, given that I did it with regard to China. And I think the question here is the notion of China and to be Chinese is, uh, is not singular. Uh, when we talk of Singapore, um, it is a Chinese populated state and we have to remember how it um, separated from the Federation of Malaysia. And so it's reacting not just to, uh, it's reacting to the Malay, you know, the Malay, uh, the notion of being a Malay state uh, within this federation, and uh, but at the same time, very popular, uh, mostly populated with Chinese. But at the same time, now I think uh, Singapore is heading towards an internationalization. So you spoke about the language policy, and you have people who speak Hokkien at home, and um, but cannot converse, uh, but cannot read Chinese, for instance, you know, um, or speak. Mandarin with a with a very um, distinct accent, and uh, when we speak of Sucho, also we have to remember um, its proximity to Shanghai. And I always get reminded of New Jersey. You know, it's sandwiched between Philadelphia and New York City, and thus it has this kind of complex. You know, like trying to be. Uh, cosmopolitan, but it's not cosmopolitan at all because it's sandwiched between these two metropoles. And, and so Sutro, I think, has always been like, it's a center of Jiangnan culture. And there is this uh, 
notion that it is a center of East Chinese culture, but at the same time, a lot of the people now in Suzhou are not from Suzhou. No wonder they cannot speak Suzhouans, right? And uh, the students that you interviewed, I think, first of all, they're millennials, uh, born, you know, like uh, in the in the two thousands. And if you speak to, and a lot of them are are from out of town. And so uh, when you ask about Suzhou culture, local culture, they don't, they don't, they cannot respond. And I think we should remember the nationalist impetus in China right now. Like there is this idea that, you know, they want to be nationalists, but at the same time, uh, local culture is kind of like, uh, not banned because it's opened up, but at the same time, there's a layer, a strong layer of this Beijing-centric, North-centric, Mandarin-centric culture uh, over this local culture, especially in the South. You, uh, you, you, you can really feel that. And so uh, my question is, I think we need to unpack this notion of Chineseness because a lot of the things, as you said, is selective, you know, uh, choosing. And I would say it's not, it's, it's kind of like a, self-orientalism really like picking picking essences of what is Chinese and projecting it in composition in musical compositions there are certain Chinese uh, compositions that are too Chinese and to the point where quote unquote it is you know it is strange and very um, unfamiliar even to um, especially to younger Chinese today so I think there's a lot to unpack here and um I was wondering if you can speak, uh, especially to this idea of, um, you know, um, this self-orientalism, as well as this idea of, you know, um, colonial outposts, uh, which Singapore used to be. It's Chinese populated, but at the same time, it doesn't want to identify with China, right? So there is this uh, con a lot of contradictions in there, and. Uh, I was wondering if you can address some of that with, of course, with, with regard to music. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you for those uh, very thought-provoking questions. Um, I'll try to remember. I, I think there were three points. You, uh, the point about the context of Singapore and then the context of Suzhou and about self-orientalism uh, in avant-garde music. Um, I would say <clears throat> uh, there are, I think uh, it's definitely correct to say that there are major differences uh, between Singapore and Suzhou. Um, however, I would defend, if I may, the strategy of including Suzhou here because I wanted to show that self-alienation uh, is something that prompts a range of responses. And it is the clearest examples that I could find of uh, countering self-alienation and Chinese reaffiliation was from Suzhou. It's not that there were no examples of that in Singapore. There were very few, like pitifully few. So it would have, it, my paper is, I think, enriched by having a broader range of considerations of self-alienation. Um, I think for Singapore, uh, it's, it's of course a much more complicated context than, uh, than what I could describe here, uh, because it is in the middle of a, uh, uh, the Malay archipelago, uh, with its own tradition of decolonial thought, uh, particularly recently with um, the writings of a uh, writer called uh, Alfin Saad, who is part Austronesian, part Chinese, and part um, Malay. And uh, he has, uh, in response to the overwhelming sort of uh, persistence of new colonial attitude in Singapore, he's proposed what he calls a Madaka history. Madaka is actually a Malay and Indonesian word, which specifically means free, freedom from colonization. So there is such a word in the, in the Malay language and Indonesian language. And that tells us that, um, that tells us, <clears throat> that uh, sort of propels us back to the era of the 50s and the 60s, when the, the whole of Southeast Asia was in the midst of decolonization politically. So, um, when we talk about Chinese identity, identity in Singapore, it's complicated further, uh, uh, yet complicated further, by the relationship of the Chinese with the Malays, because the Chinese were historically privileged under colonial rule, because they were, uh, as you know, uh, they were 
um, designated as the merchants and the business owners, whereas the Malay and Indonesian people were treated as laborers. So, so uh, economically, um, after decolonization, the Chinese people owned almost, uh, I, I would say, at least a majority of the businesses, which means that they were, uh, they had, a, had an advantage within a capitalist system. So uh, decolonization and Chinese identity in Singapore uh, has to be um, complicated in relation to uh, different frameworks, I would say. There are different kinds of relations. There is the Chinese people trying to overthrow British uh, coloniality, but there is a almost kind of, I would say, Chinese neo-colonial relationship to the British and uh, to the Indonesians. And especially now, uh, there's a lot of talk about how Singaporeans, uh, how Singapore has a foreign worker policy that mm -hmm. is very sketchy. Um, we have mm -hmm. uh, laborers from China, from China as well, and from Indonesia and from uh, India, especially India, who are given really a pittance uh, in terms of salary. And to get to Singapore, they are required to pay their employers or to pay some a middleman. Um, uh, uh, in terms of their future labor. So mm -hmm. their effort is paid for by at least two years of uh, work in Singapore. So that is not so different from the coolie system that uh, was that emerged in the 19th century after the British banned slavery. And mm -hmm. to replace the labor, we, that we invented a coolie system where ostensibly you're not a slave, but to pay for passage, you are you are obliged to work for uh, your future employer in a foreign country for a number of years under like appalling conditions, where like up to forty percent of people died during the the sea journey. So 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 it's a so we can see that it's an inc incredibly complicated in Singapore. Um, I focus mainly on uh, uh, Chinese music in this paper, but as I have. Uh, I, but I've also touched a little bit on how uh, some listeners, when you ask them about Chinese music, they immediately refer to Indian and uh, Malay music because Singapore is a self-styled self multicultural country. But this is a deflection and that is an, it is an appropriation of uh, music of other cultures to deflect from the fact that these listeners actually don't like Chinese music. So there's definitely that kind of, as in any, any, um, uh, as in any majority minority relationship, the musical relations are often unequal. And there's a lot of appropriation going on. And there's a lot, often the majority feels the freedom to sample musics and to kind of almost randomly evoke them uh, to suit their own needs. <clears throat> So, your second question was about uh, the Sujonis and the contextualization of Sujonis. And you brought up a very uh, uh, important point, which is that uh, almost half of the people living in Suzhou came from outside of Suzhou. So, that is the, the internal migration within China is, uh, is a theme that I think a lot of people are, are familiar with. And so, indeed, it was the case that with among the listeners uh, that I spoke to, who were, as you said, millennials, uh, about half of them came from outside uh, of Suzhou. But I would say this. Uh, so, of course, they don't speak Suzhounese. But even with people from Suzhou and can speak Suzhounese, they still don't understand the Suzhounese in Ping Tan because the Suzhounese used in Ping Tan is the archaic and the archaic form of it, the most traditional form, whereas uh, modern Sujonis is, uh, as you said, uh, influenced a lot by uh, Beijing Mandarin, which is sometimes called Standard Chinese. So, um, so in, in relation to uh, Suzhou, I would say uh, there is definitely that, that dynamic of uh, insider and outsider in a different way. So insiders who, were, who grew up in Suzhou and outsiders who came from outside of Suzhou, but these outsiders sometimes learn the Suzhounese dialect as well, and they become part insiders. Uh, I think the third question was on the subject of self-orientalism and avant-garde works. I would say that uh, the I would say that the way that I think about this would be 
they are facing a world in which audiences have racist expectations that composers should sound a certain way reflecting their ethnic mm -hmm. identity. And so the historical responsibility has to go back to those audiences, I would say that. And I would say also that what you said about being at the one at, uh, on, you know, composers sandwiched between being too Chinese on the one hand and not Chinese enough on the other hand is absolutely spot on. And again, these are pressures that are external, that are foisted onto them. So I'm more interested in actually, and a, a lot of these composers are living composers, so I'm a lot more interested in actually speaking to them and asking, asking them questions about why they're composing in such a way. Is it because of external pressures? Um, how do they feel about the, the uh, saturation of the global milieu, not just with racist stereotypes, but even with an over, even simply on the level of just over commodified uh, symbols, uh, emblems mm -hmm. of Chinese culture. So I really don't think they have any good options. And most of them are just writing music a lot of the time on a musical level, but at the same time affected by micro pressures. So, so that's my response. I think we should turn to other questions. We have questions in the chat. Uh, one is from Jing Han. Uh, she asked, I watch a drama series called Di Tu Dao, a very warm but also sad story about the decline of traditional theater in Singapore. Just wondering if you watched or heard of that series and if you know how it was received in Singapore. Um, that specific series I haven't come across, but uh, it's definitely correct uh, in terms of uh, identifying the decline of traditional theatre and the overall decline of uh, traditional Chinese music in Singapore. Um, I think, you know, uh, one, in, in another conversation about uh, decoloniality with a colleague, uh, uh, Amanda C.A., she mentioned that often these conversations are very draining and people come out of it feeling defeated. And what she said was, you know, Sometimes we just have to latch onto narratives that give us some hope. And I would say, uh, even, even though uh, it's declining, you still have, uh, for example, uh, I had, uh, when I was in Singapore, right, I, I went through a very westernized uh, music education. And, uh, and to di uh, a quick divergence, when, when uh, they do teach Chinese music uh, in, the high, in high schools in Singapore, but it, it's, uh, you, it's in a very superficial way. They, they will play an excerpt and you are, students are asked to like list down instruments or like describe the form. And um, it's treated like a kind of, a kind of Western music, a, a kind of pure music rather than being placed in its full Chinese cultural context. Um, so that's what I went through and, I, and that's what I taught when I was in Singapore. I was a high school teacher in Singapore. Um, but, uh, through one of my friends who uh, was about 10 years uh, older than me, he, he dragged, like, dragged all of us, uh, all of us to watch uh, uh, Nan Yin, uh, which is the uh, uh, Putian uh, opera. And um, I think ultimately it's going to depend not on like governmental uh, support. I think ultimately it's going to be a long drawn process of talking to Singaporeans about the issues that I've talked about in this paper. Like, why do you feel about Chinese music the, like that in the first place? And then um, using that as a platform to uh, encourage more of these uh, like friends, polling friends to, to um, Chinese music performances. Mm -hmm. We have two questions. Uh, first one is from Yo Chin Ma. How to address the lack of widespread availability of an ancient Chinese classical music, such as you, per, such as performing pipa, guzheng, etc., in Western standard notation system, as well as transcribed in well harmonized forms. As a learner of classical guitar and Western music, I have seen a Chinese guitarist Xue Fei, Xue Fei Yang uh, perform a few and see that it is a very successful in the global stage, in my opinion. So, uh, 
I think this is uh, probably uh, asking in the context of uh, countries outside of China, like in Australia or perhaps the US. Um, I would say there are, perhaps surprisingly, more Chinese teachers of various instruments than you might expect. Uh, this is what I understood from Nicholas, actually, that there are these masters of, uh, like the Erhu, who are found uh, in the even just in the Sydney area and various metropoles, because uh, over the past two hundred years there have been this massive migration uh, forming the Chinese diaspora, and I think it's I think the me most immediate answer is you could just find Nicholas and ask him, um, but yeah, I would say <laughs> that uh, it's uh, sometimes it's a matter of countering our perception that this is a hard, this is an art form that's hard to find it's not that easy to find but i would say i would say this even just google any city in australia and and like type chinese music next to it and very likely you will find a chinese performing arts group or a chinese uh, uh, uh associate a music association and that's a good place to start you can always write to them and ask for suggestions on who to approach and who to take lessons from and there's a question from Jessica, Jessica Kwa. Thanks for another great paper. Dr. Lee is a Malaysian Chinese. I'm thinking of Malaysian Chinese resistance to Singaporean Chinese culture and identity. And wondering if you have any insights on how self-alienation manifests and affects relationships between diasporic Chinese communities. Mm, yeah, that is, uh, that's a very good uh, line of inquiry. Um, sometimes it's uh, known as uh, transcolonial uh, thinking. So, well, this is, this is actually still within the Chinese diaspora, so maybe not transcolonial, but a, a kind of comparative approach. Uh, and definitely uh, Singapore and Malaysia has had uh, a very entangled past uh, as a, because uh, uh, some of you, as many of you will know, uh, it was briefly uh, part of uh, Malaysia in 1963 to 65 for two years. And uh, because the narrative was Singapore couldn't survive as a small island, but then uh, Singapore as a Chinese, majority Chinese uh, state uh, was different from the other Malay, uh, Malay states. So uh, there, were, there were a lot of issues that led to Singapore leaving. Um, I would. I'm inclined, as far as music is concerned, to actually, uh, and, and I'll, be, I'll be curious to hear uh, uh, what, what you have to say, actually. Um, I'm inclined to see some perhaps unexpected and surprising similarities between the state of music uh, in Singapore and Malaysia, especially as it relates to the theme of self-alienation. Um, it, I was very surprised when I found that uh, the Malaysian Society for Composers, I forgot the exact name, comprises majority Chinese composers as opposed to Malay composers. And this speaks to, I think, a couple of things. One is self-alienation uh, from Chinese music. Two is the effective institutionalization of uh, Western art music in the Chinese community and in the Chinese psyche. So um, because it was institutionalized early on uh, in China in the 50s, uh, especially from the 50s onwards, uh, people who migrated, or, or even if they didn't migrate, they have that constant reference point. You have Chinese choral music flowing to, uh, in, the, in the Western style, flowing to Southeast Asia, the Chinese orchestra flowing to Southeast Asia. Um, so the way that I've understood uh, this the, uh, Singapore and Malaysia musically has been uh, through that, and uh, I'm interested. Uh, I'll be interested to hear if you have, uh, if you'd like to say a little bit about how musically uh, it, it's uh, a little bit different. I mean, there's of, there's a lot of mutual antagonism uh, because of historical reasons, and I, I definitely it happens uh, in the political sphere. Um, Singapore is not always particularly respectful of Malaysia. Um, and uh, as every sovereign state, you, Singapore often tries to um, manipulate uh, like economic, political, and other arrangements to benefit itself. 
um, I think a very a very uh, striking example was when uh, uh, wa simple lex water. So when water was transported to Singapore, and then Singapore uh, bought, you know, by Singapore, Singapore purified it and then sold it back to Malaysia, and people were not happy about that. <laughs> I think uh, we are running out of time and uh, the floor is now closed to questions. But if you have any, uh, you're welcome to connect with Dr. Lee at, uh, his, at his email address, leeshinkang at suda.edu.cn. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Dr. Duhonko. And thank you um, very much, Dr. Lee, for your extremely well-conceived and structured paper, your work certainly addresses a huge gap in current discourse on identity and creativity in the East Asian and Chinese cultural spheres. Uh, there are so many levels of connection there for me because of what I do myself as a composer and performer in Chinese instruments. Um, I think the idea of Chinese ethnic reaffiliation is certainly very viable here in Australia amongst my students and the younger generation of musicians too. And I'm starting to wonder if um, my reasons for playing Chinese music are now I'm still viable. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm very grateful to Dr. Duhonko for joining us from Hong Kong. You contextualized mm -hmm. Dr. Lee's paper perfectly and have addressed some very interesting issues for discussion um, in your own contextualization. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. Gavin, for a very great lecture. Yes. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Thanks, uh, Mercedes, also for your, for your remarks. Uh, I really thoroughly enjoyed this. Yes, and I'm very grateful also finally to Professor Han for joining us today. Um, yes, wonderful... thanks for your intro. Yeah. Yes, and finally, thank you to everyone who has taken the time to join us. I see still uh, Dr. Claire McLean, Professor Yu from China, and a Yen from Brisbane. Uh, we really appreciate your presence. I hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is on contemporary issues regarding the Qin, the seven strings Chinese zither, and we will be featuring Dr. Tan Huang Tai in November. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>